this is a topic I've been telling people that I that gives me well, it, it, I tell you, it gives me pleasure at the same time as I find it very painful. And I hope it will be clear throughout the presentation why that is so. Uh, but it is also something that I've been sort of thinking about for a very long time. And uh, as I was putting together this lecture, I realized that I have more material than what you will be hearing. Which is a nice thing. I'm actually, there's more to say. I also want to thank you for the prayer at the beginning. I come from a long line of praying people um, from my country. My mother actually just texted me a message saying that she will be praying for me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so my next point of interest <coughs> regards verbal exchanges. Words that make their, actual words that make their way into immigrant accounts. The presence of an increasing number of immigrants prompted Indian leaders to approach the whites in attempts to stem conflicts and deteriorating influences. The source material on negotiations and councils between uh, Indians and whites is particularly rich already from the, from the colonial period and on. Um, and I'm interested in, in looking at how actual words, speeches and claims made their way into immigrant recollections and what they might tell us. So in 1834, the American Board of Commissions uh, for Foreign Missions supported a small mission aimed at the Ojibwe people near St. Croix Valley on the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. It was located next to the property and under the protection of the Danish trader Carl Wilhelm Wolf Burup. The Indians observed the mission with great suspicion. One of the Ojibwe chiefs, Giskilawe, would um, recently been on a mission to, um, on a delegation to Washington, appeared interested in, in having the mission uh, there. But the Menominee leader, Y. Ingas, expressed hostility. One evening, the Indians held a gathering in the missionaries' home, and when they ended, Y. Ingas stated, the Indians are concerned for your presence here, and you must leave. You will leave. I'm not alone in saying so. All those present here say so. But the following day, Iskilawe addressed the missionaries. He said, I speak on their, the Indians' behalf. Look at them. This land belongs to them. Since last night, we have thought over this matter. We have changed our minds. The Great Spirit made us all, made us red, made you white. He gave you your religion, culture, and practices. He gave us ours. Why would we send you away? We do not wish that you leave. No, no, we say to you all, stay. You may plant and build, but the country is ours. Our great father has sent you here. We are grateful. We tell you why we fear the whites. We fear you shall take away our land. If this room was filled with trade goods, we could not trade away our country for them. This land is ours and our children's. It is all that we have. A representation of Indian oratory like this um, is a common feature of Euro-American accounts of interactions with American Indians. So while there is reason to be a bit cautious about assuming that these are just simple reproductions of what Indian people did say, there is um, nonetheless also good reasons to take these words seriously as sources to uh, what American Indians wished to convey. His Killaway's oration may not be a word-for-word -word accurate account of what he said, but it relays significant meaning. And I'm using this picture of a, an Ojibwe petition um, um, that, that signifies um, <coughs> that the different clans um, are of one mind and one heart, um, and also that this, all these figures represent the different clans and that they do not want to be removed from the wild rice beds near Lake Erie. <coughs> so this, this, this short account in the Swedish sources then points to um, uh, the fact that, that um, Indians sought to come to a consensus uh, agreement before they spoke <coughs> and relayed their, their message. Um, it shows that uh, Indians deliberated over the virtues of contact with Europeans. 
And it finally it emphasizes a determination not to part the land. Another form of intrusion emerges in accounts of actual individual encounters. One example is from Gustav Unonius' account published in 1862. On a number of occasions, Unonius uh, mentions Indians and describes them, usually in a manner that very clearly places Indians in an in a inferior, uncivilized category in relation to Americans and Swedes, and white Americans and Swedes. Much of his uh, material is apparently second hand derived from readings or conversations with white Americans. But this pattern is broken on a few occasions. On one such, Anunius had begun his first commission as a pastor to several congregations in northern Wisconsin. He traveled in his carriage between a Swedish and a Norwegian settlement when he found himself lost in the forest. He left the carriage to ride the horse onward when he heard a high-pitched scream. Three armed Indians rushed toward him, took hold of his horse, and gestured to him to come with them. Filled with fear, he complied, but explained to them that he was in a hurry. He writes, they did not seem to understand much English, and my knowledge of their language did not allow any closer communication between us. So after a while, they arrived in the Indians' camp, consisting of eight to ten huts. And this is the actual um, illustration that he uses in the book. It turned out to be a sugar camp, not a war camp. Um, uh, and he saw women busy cooking pots of maple syrup. Men and women and children surrounded him, and he presumed some of the men to be intoxicated. He noted that the men had beards, and from that he drew the conclusion that they were Potawatomis. He had met some before and attempted a brave face as he asked for his old acquaintance, Kewa Goshkum. He wasn't there, but eventually an old woman stood up before him looked at him kindly, quote, and spoke thereafter to the others some words of which I could only discern Neskeshin Chomokomon, good white man, Kewa Goshkum and Okonomobo, a name common to all waterways around our small lake. After a short council, they let go of my horse and asked me to Pokaje, get away from there, which I certainly was quick to comply with. So he ended up in a, in a sugaring camp, um, uh, and he had his, his head was full of, of, of um, and James Fenimore Cooper um, ideas of Indians that we're going to scalp him. Um, this brief encounter deserves a more, much more thorough discussion than I can offer here, but I was struck by it for a couple of reasons. It belongs to a genre of eyewitness accounts, descriptions of experiences that involves the author directly and personally, and which serve, among other things, as a truth claim to the surrounding um, information. So it's, it's like, because I've been there, I've seen it with my own eyes, um, I've experienced it with my own body, what I tell you is the truth. And that has been the foremost foundation for knowledge claims in Europe, at least since the 19th. And, and I found that, that this is a, something that in many sort of accounts that I've looked at that, that deal with um, <coughs> descriptions of encounters with, with native people, um, the, these sort of personal experiences will change the pace and the pattern of the travel account as a whole. And, and one of the ways in which the, this account, <coughs> this account sort of supports this, or strengthens this claim of truth, is that he adds a long footnote, in which he talks about sugaring, about the production of maple syrup, and he talks about uh, the amounts, specific, the amounts that the Indians produced from this, and how also Norwegian and Swedish people had learned how to, to make this syrup, maple syrup from the Indians. Another rather spectacular intrusion occurs in Frederica Bremer's letters. In October of 1850, she visits some of the codas in their lodges. There you see her picture, a very good one, but nonetheless. Um, and she asks if she may paint them. She describes the beauty, but also the shyness of the young feather cloud woman. Um, when her husband, the young warrior Skonkaska, or white dog, entered fully painted and in fancy clothes with a huge red feather bonnet which like a helmet went from the head and down the back and with three dark eagle feathers with red wool and tassels high in the air. 
He was tall and lithe of body and entered with a joyous, lively countenance, while uttering a stream of words as rapid as the one I heard in the House of Representatives in Washington, and of which I understood just as much. <laughs> just as in Anonio's account, the Indian's intrusion changes the pace and character of an otherwise distant description. And here, is also the, here also the Indian speaks, but the Swede cannot understand. In the context of Brian's <coughs> earlier um, um, assertion um, that I quoted to you, that when she arrives in Minnesota, this encounter adds power to the contention that this was indeed Indian land. So if these two examples demonstrate that Swedes had landed in the Kota and Potawatomi country and that it was for them to learn the language, the next example is in English and uttered in precise words, gauged to avoid misunderstanding. Only a few years later, in 1862, Swedes became party to another affirmation of Indian ownership and claims. Some settlers complained about Indians stealing their pigs and a group of young immigrants accompanied by the Reverend Andrew Jackson, ventured out to catch the thieves. They came upon a Dakota camp and found one man roasting a pig over a fire. Charging him with theft, the young man attacked, but soon an overwhelming force of Dakota surrounded them, and Chief Little Crow, who was among them, came out of his tent. With a stick, he drew a mark on the ground, which he said represented the Mississippi River. Uh, another, the Minnesota River, there, uh, and the third represented a line from Big Stone Lake northeastward. So it's up here, isn't it? Not entirely sure, actually, on this map. Uh, pointing to this rough map, he said, with deliberate emphasis, this is all my land. All game, all pigs are mine. The white man must move off my land to the other side of Fort Snelling. Victor E. Lawson, who wrote about this incident, claimed that it deeply affected the immigrants present, and Swedish-born Reverend Jackson wrote to Minnesota Governor Ramsey. <coughs> um, you might think that he wrote to relate to Dakota's point of view, but no. He wrote to ask, quote, that the Indians be restrained from doing further mischief. With Little Crow's adamant defense of Indian ownership, we're brought right back into the build-up to the most violent conflagration involving Indians and Scandinavian immigrants, the Dakota conflict in the late summer of 1862. Violence such as um, that experienced and remembered from this conflict is a physical intrusion that makes its way into the sources. Disruptive violence also may be read as an encounter between Indians and immigrants, one that could not so easily be crossed over. Fear of Indian violence traveled with immigrants on the way over from Sweden, in fact. The Nornius previously I mentioned, it. he had read uh, Fenimore Cooper before he arrived, and so had um, um, Friedrich Abraham. And uh, so they, they and, and uh, a host of Swedish authors and Norwegian as well, that reference um, the novels that they had already read before they came to America. Hugo Nisbet wrote in the 1870s, when the, at, at the time when he first, the first time he actually met um, American Indians. It was not but that I felt a cold shiver down my spine when I neared the Redskins' wigwams. Bloody scalps, tomahawks, peace pipes, peace and war belts, etc., etc., with which Cooper's novels inflamed the imagination danced around helter-skelter in my head. And so, in, in Swedish periodicals of the period, of the mid-19th uh, century, you could easily get, find these kinds of images. Um, um, very stereotypical. Killing the female prisoner, the fate of soldier Charlie, and my favorite here, um, sort of the Hollywood <laughs> stagecoach attack. So the idea of Indians as dangerous, as, as, as violent, and as abusive um, seemed to sort of predate um, immigration and, and certainly many of the encounters. Still, 
the conflict of 1862 had a great impact on the imaginations of Swedes and, and other Scandinavians. I assume that most of you are familiar with the outlines of the conflict, and so I'll just treat it very briefly. The Kota Indians were forced onto a reservation after treaties at Traverse de Sioux and Mendoza in 1851 took to arms in the late summer of 1862 when annuities did not come, causing starvation. More than 500 settlers were killed during the following month, and an unknown number of Dakotas, before they were forced to surrender to the U.S. Army at the end of September. A military commission condemned over 300 Dakotas to death, but the, the President Lincoln pardoned all but 38 of them. The rest were imprisoned at Camp McClellan in um, Davenport, just across the river here, under gruesome conditions until they were sent to the newly established Santee Reservation in western Nebraska in 1866. One year later they were forced to move again to the Dakota Territory after Nebraska citizens refused their presence in the state. The conflict had its epicenter in southwestern Minnesota and the violence descended upon the Scandinavian settlers in Kandiyohi County like a lightning from a clear sky on August 20th, 1862. On a sunny afternoon at the Blueberry and Lundborg homesteads, Indians arrived and greeted the families as usual. But suddenly they opened fire and killed five men, then pursued a wagon and shot the driver and killed his wife and their small child with a vicious blow from their axes. Others fled in terror, gathering towards nightfall on an island in Norway Lake, and in the next couple of days they buried 13 bodies in a common grave. Their memories filled with horror precisely because Indians pursued friendly to part in massacres of white settlers. Swedish language papers reported on the conflict and correspondence charged both um, Sioux, um, Dakota, and Chippewa, or Chippewa warriors, with, with, quote, raging like wild animals, burning, pillaging, and murdering all in their path, unquote. 24 Swedish and Norwegian settlers died in the fighting and Victor Lawson, who wrote extensively about Scandinavian settlements in the Kandiyohi region, was adamant that, quote, they had given the Indians no just cause for complaints or revenge. These immigrants were absolutely innocent of any wrong done to the red man, unquote. But were they? For the Dakotas, the war and the memories of its felt unmitigated disaster. The conflict tore the community from the inside, as some Dakotas saw no other way than war, while others refrained from taking up arms. It meant exile from the tribe's homeland and devastation. What did they think of the immigrants? <coughs> Gary Anderson, in his biography of Little Crow, notes Indian displeasure with settlers. And you can see his quote there. The members of the Mdewakanton Soldiers Lodge particularly disliked German and Scandinavian settlers who shared very little with them. So stingy, not sharing, food in particular, is that how Indians are <coughs> Scandinavian immigrants? Anderson writes that by the early 1860s relations between Dakotas and white settlers were severely strained as a consequence of the sheer numbers of newcomers. <coughs> And the cultural perceptions they brought with them didn't help the situation. Continues, most newcomers were from Germany or Scandinavia and carried a cultural baggage into Minnesota that was of necessity thrifty, so they saw no reason to share resources with Indians. Unquote. Clearly, the Dakota conflict made an imprint on the people who lived through it, and it lives on today as memories linger and fester in generations who've inherited the trauma. But it is not the only instance of brute physical incursion that mars the history of Swedish and Indian entanglements. So my last example takes us back across the Atlantic and into the institutional world of the academy, at our own doorstep, in fact, as scholars. In 1874, three Pawnees, Ke Utaka, or White Fox, Ataka Staka, White or Grey Eagle, and Red Fox, whose name in Pawnee was not recorded in Swedish sources, traveled to the Nordic countries. As far as I know, this is the first time the American Indians visited um, Sweden. Throngs of curious spectators in southern Sweden, in Copenhagen, in Denmark, and in Oslo in Norway, paid to see 
real Indians. White fox, who you see uh, to the right here, he's also sit sitting in the middle, hailed from a high-ranking Pawnee family. All of the men spoke English. Very little is known about the circumstances surrounding their trip to Scandinavia. One possibility is that they were induced to come by two Swedish immigrants um, who sought to gain wealth by tapping into the interest, um, the growing interest in the exotic, um, exoticism of American Indians in Europe at the time. There is circumstantial evidence that they may have met uh, the Pawnees, the immigrants may have met the Pawnees when they traveled through recent Scandinavian settlements in Pawnee country, such as Dannebro in Nebraska or Lindsborg. Kansas. In the early 1870s, Pawnees were forced to accept a reservation in Indian territory. The visit from the three Pawnees thus occurred right in the middle of the formation of Scandinavian settlements and the Pawnees' loss of their home territory. Sadly, White Fox suffered from tuberculosis and died in the spring of 1875 at Sog in Anska at the main hospital in Göteborg. Red Fox and White Eagle demanded to take the body back to America to bury him there. But Swedish doctors and anthropologists refused to miss out on such an opportunity to study an example of primitive physiology. The body was sent to Karolinska Sjukhuset in Stockholm, where the professor of anatomy, Gustav von Duben, performed an autopsy. Not satisfied with that, he had the body flayed and the skin fitted onto a gypsum cast of White Fox's torso. As such, the skin was shown at Sweden's first anthropological exhibition in 1878. The history of what happened to the white fox on his trip to Sweden is one of violence and horror. Not until 1996 was his body and his skin returned to American soil and interred in Pawnee country in Oklahoma. His clothes and some other objects are still in the collections of the Museum of World Cultures in Göteborg. For the Swedish scholars, the study of White Fox's body was a matter of science. Von Dieben worked at the cutting edge of physical anthropology and is best known for his work with Sami craniology, Sami, the indigenous peoples of northern Scandinavia. But for the Pawnees, the treatment was nothing short of abuse. Lawrence Goodfox, chairman of the Pawnee Tribe of Oklahoma <coughs> in the 1980s, described how Pawnees looked at death. He writes, when our people die and go on to the spirit world, Sacred rituals and ceremonies are performed. We believe that if the body is disturbed, the spirit becomes restless and cannot be at peace. And he described how consequences for descendants and for those that handle the body could be both spiritual and physical and lead to illness and even to death. Karolinska Institute is the institute that chooses the recipients of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the greatest discoveries in physiology or medicine. I think we're due to hear who gets it this year. <coughs> but Roger Echohawk, contemporary Pawnee writer, finds no benefit in the treatment of white fox. He writes, when I picture the scene, it's difficult to look at it. I look because I think white fox has something important to say to us all. So, I'll pause occasionally to listen. I want to learn something useful out of this. Even so, I don't get it. What worthwhile knowledge did we accrue from this treatment of white fox? I listen, but I can't hear much beyond my own horror. Echo Hawk lays the blame squarely at the feet of the venerable academic <coughs> institution, reminding all of us who serve as scholars to examine deeply the histories and traditions of violence and abuse that inflict the very foundations of our academic scholarship. So this brings the challenge back to me and to my contemporary historians. In the late 1980s, a poem entitled A Freedom Song attracted my attention. The author, Tala Sunny, described himself as, quote, of the Oglala Sioux, with almost an equal part of me, Swedish, unquote. But this mixture caused him tension, apparently, because he continues, Beyond these emotions lay the ancestral chantings of the freedom song my pale grandfather never quite understood from the lips of my Oglala grandmother who was once raped by a white settler. Though briefly presented, the anguish of this historical, historical entanglement was apparent, but what struck me most was his name. Tala Sani means speak the truth in Swedish. <laughs> Did the pale grandfather choose his name for an Oglala grandson, or did the 
man take the name himself as a reference to his Swedish ancestry? I don't know, but I've carried this brief encounter with me for years, building in me a desire to speak the truth about Swedish and American Indian relations. To do so will require cooperation and exchange among practitioners of American Indian immigration and ethnic history, each bringing their expertise, methodologies, and knowledge to the encounter. So this lecture has hopefully been a contribution to this, and the symposium tomorrow will continue in this important endeavor. And I invite every one of you and all future scholars that have seen here, saying that this is, there's, there's a lot to be done in this area. So thank you very much for listening. And the fact that that club was. See, that's another, I'm telling you, this is a field that's wide open for scholarship and, and for, for knowledge. Uh, no one has researched the Indian Club, and I, I myself was rejected. I tried to become a member, but they had an age limit. You had to be over 18 to be a member. Um, it, it was, it was at, 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 at one point in the 1960s and 70s, and into the 80s, I would say, it was quite influential in forming and in, in producing literature in Swedish. And Alvin Medean, in the first years, he wrote in every single one of the yearbooks. Um, he produced an enormous amount of material. Um, some of it published, some of it is, is, is sort of in a manuscript state kept at the Swedish, as you know, um, at the, the Swedish Emigrants Institute in Bexham. Um, now the Indian Club still exists, but it, it's, sort of, uh, it's a very sort of marginal appearance. But the, the, what really made an impact in Sweden um, was that one of the co-founders of the organization, Erik Unkas Engel, he won the uh, quiz show in 1962 or 63, um, on the topic of American Indians, and, and he, he, his, he was, his nickname was Uncas, Uncas. Um, and, and he became incredibly popular. He was, uh, yeah, so, so a lot of people knew about it, and knew about their work and what they were doing. At the same time, it's, as Les, you were saying, he certainly romanced, uh, I mean, the, the yearbooks that they produced um, uh, is, is full of references to sort of um, uh, boys play and to, to, to campfires and, and, and to playing in the But I, I wish someone, I've been trying to find a graduate student, to take on that as a topic. So, anyone here? Just let me know. Do you want to tell us about the symbol on your shirt? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a symbol. It's just a shirt that I happen to like. Oh, well, I'm not medium, but I'm no. medium design. But, that, but my earrings are turtle earrings. The turtle, of course, being the symbol of native land. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about Certainly in the beginning of your talk, you suggested that, that this would have implications for um, the way immigrant history is, uh, is interpreted. Um, there must be some need or need. This is totally outside my field. Sorry. Uh, this is completely outside my field, yeah. but certainly there must be major themes of immigration. Um, what, do you have any ideas about what, what interpretive threads might be radically changed by putting these two fields together? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I, 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 it's a really difficult question for me to answer because I'm just beginning to learn something about immigration history. Just like you, it's, it's a field that's, that's very new to me. Um, and, and I think that, so at the moment I'm just learning. I'm really trying to learn about it. But I think that, that um, there is an important strand, that, which also I think was part, partly what I have been emphasizing here, and that has to do with land, has to do with the notions about land, the notions about, so, um, when I read it, it, 
let's, let me just put it this one. When I read immigrant accounts, I've been reading this for the last couple of days, if you, I'm, I'm struck by um, <coughs> the profound sense of, of loss that, that they convey. They, they left their homeland, and they mourn for their homeland. Um, and, and, at, at the, and at at this very moment when they do this, they still describe this as, a, as, a, as an empty land, a land that is free for them to take. And I think that is, 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 that is where these two histories ought to be able to, to both connect, but also question, certainly question them. They're, they're very easy and seemingly naturalized uh, acceptance of manifest destiny, that seems to be. So far, I've found in all of the accounts that I've written. But I think also that another aspect of it, which I think is important, is that, um, where, where, for instance, that the, both in Sweden, and, and I'm, I know Sweden better, but this is just an example. I'm, this could be applied equally, I imagine, to Norway, Denmark, to Germany, to any other immigrant population. But there's such strong notions of Swedes being sort of good, good, weak but good um, immigrants and, and colonizers. Um, and so the, 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 the emphasis is on the, the good relationships, on the friendships, and on innocence. Like, for instance, about the Dakota conflict, that the Swedes were, the Swedes were in fact described as victims, um, as much victims as the Dakotans themselves. Um, and I think that is a problematic notion that needs to be questioned, that needs to be looked at. This is a, that the immigrants, immigrants and Indians and Yankees, you want to use that term, occupy at least three different positions. But they all play on the same field. A very good answer, but it's some starting out. <laughs> <laughs> you I was wondering if you'd looked at guidebooks, just this notion of the empty land. Sorry. That the guidebooks that the immigrants read before they yeah. came to the US. I was struck by when you're talking about this, I read one of them and there's Nothing about India. I think I, I found like one sentence or one paragraph. Yeah. And that, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that I think is, is why it's uh, been, in, in most histories of the uh, of immigration histories, I mean, the, the fact that, that they will maybe mention that they, you know, in the prehistory there were Indians there, but then there aren't any. And, 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 and there's a lot of official literature just like, like the guidebooks that, that completely ignore or don't mention that at all. But then when immigrants come to this, what they think of in this new land or the new Scandinavia, there are Indians everywhere. And just, it's like a, a big sass where he's got. Dependent clause. thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they will be saying something and then sort of just like in passing, they will say, oh, there are lots of Indians there. And they don't say it was just one Indian, and I happen to see him at a distance, but they say frequently. The place was filled with Indians. There were all Indians all around us. And then they will go on to talk about that. Something else. We have a lot of guests from Mexico. Uh -huh. And uh, if I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, we have fun with that reservation right there. And they always want to go see the reservation. You seem to have quite an uh, odd idea of what the reservation of you is when you get there because it's just like the rest of the city. And I'm wondering what you thought of that. I do. You, you're, I mean, if you're uh, among the people from Mecca, have you run into that? They have a real fascination with the reservation. Too, so. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's a lot of fascination. Not, not so much, it's a sort of a generational thing, but certainly my generation and older people are very interested and have very romanticized notions. Uh, and and, and, and the, the, the same notions that, well, the idea that Indians are frozen in time and, and a real Indian can only exist in the past. 
and anything else is, 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 is problematic for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't you think part of that is, is due to the popularity of Elmer and the, yeah. the, his depiction mm -hmm. of Native Americans? Yeah. I mean, that's the most, some of the most read novels yeah. in Sweden, and then mm -hmm. he has a very particular kind of image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, 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 for us, we see, uh, yes. for uh, at least, Many older generations certainly Mumbai has had a tremendous impact. And he's being reissued again now, so he's probably doing another <laughs> Could you comment a little bit on the popularity of the Indian image that came before Mumbai to Sweden via the very popular German author Karl May, who was at one point better known yes. than almost anybody? Yes. Well, actually, I should refer you to you, Mas, here, because he has done research on the, on the Indian novels um, produced in Sweden. Sweden was very early. In no, there's a, uh, there's a huge, Kalmai is actually the last of them. There's a huge number before them. And they're Europeans, so that's Gunnar's point about romancing. They're Europeans aping Cooper. And that starts in the 1860s, and it's a flood coming in, um, up until the 20s or so, at least. So it is, it predates the large immigration base. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Definitely. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. Is there any comparison between how the African Swedes viewed the Native Americans they met and how they viewed the Sami in their own country? Well, um, I think that the answer would be different depending on the <coughs> time we're talking about. Um, th there's there's some comparison used. I mean, even in the early 17th century sources from the New Sweden colony, th there um, th there is a, some some comparison, um, which is suggesting that that <coughs> Swedes did recognize these as sort of separate pe different peoples from themselves. And also it had a notion of some kind of movement in time that that, uh, that you could look at. They could look at Sami society or India society in order to see the way in which Swedes had lived in in, in prehistoric days. Um, so and and but then as we get into um, the 19th century, the um, Towards the end of it, with people like scholars like uh, Gustav von Duben and uh, now, of course, I can't remember names, but there's a whole lot of several of them that are now beginning to, to study sort of primitive peoples, and then uh, uh, Samis are included in that. But in the 18th century, Samis were not particularly thought of as, as sort of a special, separate people. Um, and what in today, contemporary sort of notions, I would say, I, I once had a student who did a study of um, school libraries, the literature that school libraries provided um, regarding Native Americans and, um, and Sami people. And she found that the books that describe Native Americans all dealt with history, were historical accounts or, or sort of stories set in the past, whereas the literature that de dealt with Sami, well, all, almost all of it dealt with a, um, a contemporary situation and identity um, issues, particularly for young people sort of growing up realizing there were Sami, which sort of gave the, uh, gave the sense that American Indians were stuck in the past, whereas Sami people have no past. <laughs> so there is a difference. Yes. I'm curious why the choice of the of the term immigrant because I think it's it's a quite recent term used in the currency of the term is pretty recent and I think it's very interesting to look at the Swedes as immigrants, right? Because from our standpoint right now they were. But I'm curious to know what the how they refer to themselves. Yeah. If they talk if they spoke to themselves and describe themselves as immigrants. And then also gave the long-time settlers, white Americans from however some years, if they referred to them as immigrants or what term was used. And also gave in those sources, right, where the Swedes are writing, incorporating Native Americans in these ways, right? If there is any mention also of how they are being perceived by them, if they would be 
one or several if they were if they had a category, right? If they belong to a category of something else, or yeah. in the universe or something. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't. I, I'm not really the, the person to ask. I think part of that question I would refer to dog because I really don't know about the terminology. I mean, you have in Swedish the word, word utvandrare, which has been in use historically as well. I don't know if they, Scandinavian immigrants, would refer to themselves as invandrare in the 19th century. They did. They did. They did. Okay. Um, but I, that's not something I really am not comfortable with it because I really don't know enough. But uh, uh, whereas they saw themselves as a different group, um, there is a couple. Of, I found a couple of references. Um, this is partly from my earlier research on um, New Sweden, where Swedes describe themselves as being seen as different. That, 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 that they describe that the Lenape people saw the Swedes as being different and had a separate word for the Swedes. And then they had another a word that meant friend or, or similar to us or something. And then they had another word for English that was stranger. Um, and then I found a similar reference like that, 19th century uh, Minnesota. Um, I think, Joy, haven't, didn't you ask? Yeah, I found this too. Uh, and I talked to somebody, I think this was on the last resolution. Yeah. They told me that they had different words that I could considered to be sort of a fur trader and mail carrier and a settler and also if I believe married an Indian uh, woman. Two. 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 Oh. oh <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just wondered if you considered the vote. Yeah, I, I actually had a section on that, but I cut that out and I decided it was too much to fit into the paper. But certainly intermarriage is a very, very uh, it's it, and it's huge. And, and and I mean if you look at just, just sort of names on the registry. Of course, people intermarried, or they had sex and produced babies, whether they then married or not. It's another story. But it's like Tola Sunni. There are many, many people in, uh, in this land who, who have their heritage from all sorts of places, um, and, and, and that, and, and, and that is, is I think, is. I think it is, it is too important for me to just say a line about it. I actually deliberated whether I should or shouldn't, but I decided not to. Because I think it is so important that it deserves so much thorough investigation and naturally, because that uh, in itself, of course, questions the categories of Indian and immigrants in a very necessary way. 